And the great thing about the California Island Symposium is that we're able to bring together all these different very bright and dedicated people who are working over um, many different islands and also many different disciplines. And we can start talking about how these different things interact and what are some great collaborations that we could do for better understanding these islands. And are there some species or some ecosystems that are not doing well? And this is a wonderful event in that it's a cross-disciplinary uh, approach to conservation. We're hearing from archaeologists, biologists, botanists, and it's a really incredible experience for us to be able to listen to all of those experts and take from them not just what's happening, but also offering us future areas where we really need to be focusing our resources to protect uh, the environment in a, in a rapidly changing world. What's so important about this meeting is that it, uh, it brings researchers together to talk about what they're learning. But I think the other thing it does is it stimulates some new thought, is how do we look into the future? Because all these people come together and they start talking about what each is learning and how it builds that story even further. This place is becoming, I think, uh, internationally known as a, as a place of great intrigue but also a welcoming place to do science. Recently we've been holding this symposium about every four years and every symposium seems to grow. There's nothing like getting together face to face, which is what happens at the symposium. For this ninth symposium we have over 600 people gathered together who have all different types of interests regarding the islands and what happens at the islands in some ways also reflects what's happening in the greater world. And so the the California Island Symposium is a great time for us to sit back and to look at that, that bigger world and to talk with scientists who are researching what's going on and can help us understand um, some of the things that are happening. of introducing our first plenary speaker. Uh, Tori Rick is a researcher and is a director and curator of the North American Archaeology uh, Department for the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, he studies the archaeology and the historical ecology of coastal island peoples. Um, he was born in Ventura, uh, currently lives in DC, but certainly calls Ventura his home. Um, and fun fact, he went to school with Jack Johnson and actually wrote songs with him and was in a band with him. So you can bug him about that later. Um, <laughs> he'll be speaking on the insularity, the sea coast, and the archaeology of the California islands. Um, this talk will describe case studies from the islands in the tropical Pacific, Eastern Africa, Southeast Asia, and Europe, and will provide context for understanding the archaeological and historical ecology of the California Islands. So join me in welcoming Tori Rick. Well, uh, thank you, Christy, and good morning, everyone. I don't know about you, but I am pretty fired up about those plush toys. Uh, <laughs> And the cereal box earrings, too. I don't I just, I was kind of torn over there. Christmas came early, didn't know what to do. I'm gonna, let me see if I can load my actual talk. And Rocky, I know you're here somewhere in case we need you. And Rocky, I think we need, so it's not, I'm not getting a cursor there. While we're loading that, though, um, you know, thanks to Denise and thanks to Christy and, and uh, certainly Annie and the whole planning committee for pulling this off. This is a colossal effort but one that I know I look forward to every four years, and I think all of us do too, and I'm just delighted to, uh, to be a part of it. I also wanna, before I get started, say thanks to a lot of my colleagues too. While you know, I'm the one giving this talk, um, this work really represents the work of a lot of people and, and, and a lot of thinking over the years. And so, you know, of course, my colleague John Erlinson, uh, Todd Bragey, Renee Volanowicz, Mike Glassow, John Johnson, the list goes on and on for all the archaeologists I've worked with, and then more recently with just a number of biologists and ecologists. Too many to name here, but I have a big uh, acknowledgments page at the end there. Um, I think it's kind of safe to say that all of us, every one of us in this room is united by a common thing, and that's that we all have a great interest, a great care, and a deep passion for the California Islands. 
Now, whether that means the islands of the Gulf of California, uh, the islands of the Pacific coast of Baja, right here in the Channel Islands, or maybe it's the islands of the San Francisco Bay or the Farallon Islands, you know, those islands are special places. They're places with incredible biodiversity, incredible ecosystems. They're places with really beautiful records of people through time, great records of Native American occupation through the ranching period to commercial fishing, and then great geological records, paleontological records, all of those things that make the Channel Islands this beautiful layer cake that is pretty much unparalleled for, for learning and for knowledge and for understanding our planet. I'm always sort of amazed every time I fly out here from, from D.C. And the first thing that I, I see or get is um, a view of, of like the one at the top left. That's a, a view of uh, Los Angeles. You know, I come into this place that's chaotic. It's one of the biggest cities in the world. But in just a quick boat ride, I'm transported to some place like the bottom there. I'm transported to some place where you can sit in the Torrey Pine Grove there and stare out at Betcher's Bay and arguably one of the most beautiful places in the world. And it's never lost on me that just right across the channel is this place that's full of hustle and bustle and all those things that, that typify human society and typify what we people are able to do. But of course, with that, you know, that great interest and that respect for how special the Channel Islands are, I think comes a lot of hope and optimism. And one of the reasons that I think so many of us are here, and I think we'll hear about this tomorrow in our plenary too, one of the things that make the Channel Islands so special is they give us so much hope, right? They give us hope in a world that's full of uncertainty, a world that's full of chaos, where we're constantly bombarded by bad news, as if climate change wasn't enough, we get something every 30 seconds from Donald Trump to make us freak out, right? We're, we're in a world that's just full and full of bad news. But places like the Channel Islands offer us a little bit of hope, a hope for a place where we can, you know, we can have a world with wilderness, or we can have a world with wild places, places where you can see an island fox roam around, or you can see an island racer foraging in the inner tidal, or an island scrub jay, an auklet, a dudley eye. The list goes on and on and on. And with that hope, I think, comes the need to protect, right? The need to preserve, the need to conserve. And we're lucky to have places like the National Park Service, the Nature Conservancy, the Catalina Island Conservancy, the Navy, the list goes on and on for all the groups invested in protecting and preserving the Channel, Channel Islands and the California Islands more broadly. As an archeologist, for me, that protection often means archeological sites like this one. Now, how many of you have been to Anacapa Island? And yes, I'm making you raise your hands. Isn't that terrible? I mean, like a huge, so we got to double that, right, from the people who raise their hands. Probably 80% of you or more, I would guess, have been to Anacapa Island, which means you've walked across this site right here. This is a and 2 on Anacapa Island. It's a prime spot on some of the naturalist tours as well. Well, we got involved excavating and testing this site a number of years ago because you know, this is a site that gets trampled by people every day. It's eroding and, and being affected by our activities. So as an archeologist, the need is to protect and preserve those cultural resources or to understand the sites that are eroding into the sea and into the ocean. And as a biologist, you know, the lesson of protection and that comes about restoration, right? We've just seen a, a, an amazing transformation of the Channel Islands over the last 200 years. Right, as we move out of the ranching period, we move out of the period of massive commercial fisheries and the, the fur trade, right, a real transformation of both what was going on around the Channel Islands in the waters and what was happening on land. And of course, the focus has been on restoration. The focus has been on how do we undo the major impacts that people have had on the Channel Islands, like the ranching period. And of course, you're looking at cattle marching along towards the Torrey Pine Grove before they were removed. And one of my favorite pictures, it's in one of Marla Daly's books on Santa Barbara Island. It's one of the former landowners of Santa Barbara Island out on Guadalupe Island, pointing a gun at a Guadalupe for, or at a uh, northern elephant seal. Just a great shot. Luckily, we don't see these scenes too much anymore unless you're at a Trump rally. And I've made two Trump references in the last, <laughs> like, I don't know what is going on here. But we see images like this. And for me, what I often hear is we need to undo that. We need to get out what I call the big eraser of time, right? And we need a big eraser. You got to get in there and really scrub it. And of course, when you need a big eraser, you need one like this. That's the eraser that's for really big mistakes. You don't need the one that gets in there and smears it. You need the really big eraser. 
And that, the way I often feel and when I hear us talking about restoration is we need to take people out of the equation, and people out of the picture. And that's fine and dandy, I agree with that. When I go on a hike and somewhere I get bummed out when I see somebody, I don't wanna be around people. <laughs> but what I wanna talk about for the rest of today and how what I wanna build on what I was just saying is, is I wanna talk about how I think that's a missed opportunity. By not keeping people into the equation and not thinking about people in our restoration, of course thinking about visitors and those things, but not thinking about the effects of people and the legacy of people, we have a really missed opportunity to do something that I think is better, something that's more representative of what the Channel Islands are actually like, what the real, true Channel Islands are. All right, so what I wanna talk about now is I wanna take us on an odyssey. It's gonna be a bit schizophrenic because of the time that we have, the short time, but I wanna take us on a brief global odyssey to look at and talk about human colonization of islands all around the world. This is something I've been studying for, for a number of years, something that's been, been of interest to me since I was an undergraduate at UC Santa Barbara. But I wanna take us on an odyssey that starts in Africa and then builds out to Australia, Southeast Asia, and elsewhere, showing us the time frame in which people got to those islands, and then just a quick few snapshots of how people influenced those island ecosystems. And my, my emphasis is gonna be on the subtle things, the wild plants and animals they may have introduced or maybe the impact they had on shellfish. Not the big transformations, not the agricultural transformations, but the more subtle ones, the ones that I think are more akin to what we saw on the Channel Islands in the prehistoric period. Once we finish this odyssey, I wanna come back full circle and talk about the California Islands and then ultimately, hopefully, sum that up into something coherent. All right, so let's start that, that journey and odyssey around the world. Pretty much when you talk about humans and you talk about the antiquity of people and, and where we came from, that, that's a, a journey that always starts in Africa. And I'm gonna give you one small caveat um, to, to just tip you off a little to my bias here. I'm gonna be talking almost exclusively about modern humans. There are earlier cases of people using marine resources, our earlier ancestors, Homo erectus, other members of our genus, and there are possibly even earlier cases of seafaring, but I'm gonna focus largely on us modern humans, I think it gives us a deep enough starting point um, to really think about broader issues. So we start in Africa, and there's been a number of excavations over the last 10 years or so that really transformed our thinking about people and marine resources. So we're not starting on islands, we're starting, starting on a continental landmass. If you rewound the clock to when I was just starting out in graduate school or the early 90s, we were starting to come out of a haze and we were starting to realize that marine ecosystems were actually really important, were big players in the human experience and human evolution. Prior to that, they had been cast off into the margins. What's happened in the last 10 or 15 years is an explosion. There have been a number of cave sites, particularly in South Africa, who have shown very early, or which have shown very early use of marine resources by humans. One of those is Blombos Cave, which is pictured on here, and then another one that I'm gonna talk about right now is at a place called Pinnacle Point, where Curtis Marion at Arizona State has been working. This is a view from inside of the cave at Pinnacle Point. This cave was reported in Nature by Curtis and his group uh, back in 2007. This cave produced shellfish, showing people were foraging in the intertidal zone, but it also produced some really sophisticated blade-like stone tools. It produced uh, possible ochre that was used for pigment, maybe some of the earliest artistry, and this started off thinking about human cognition and brain development, and possibly suggested, this is a time right about when our, our species is actually emerging, and what this suggested, and John Earls has talked a lot about this and others, is that perhaps the marine foods helped with our brain size, our brain expansion. Those rich omega fatty acids may have increased some of our, our intellect and our, our, our other cognitive capabilities. When you move out and move forward, oh, 100,000 years, we can do that quickly. You get to another cave, Blombos Cave in that same area. This is one that Curtis Henselwood and his group has reported on, not far from Pinnacle Point. You know, quite a bit later, still occupied by modern humans, but 70,000 years ago is a very long time ago, and this shows an even further development of some of the things we saw at Pinnacle Point. This shows even more sophisticated stone tools. So this is a view of that cave, a view of them working inside the cave. Um, then some of the tools that came out of it, really sophisticated chipstone bifaces, scrapers. What's even more exciting 
are these objects, shell beads, no scale on there, they're very small, but personal adornment, ornamentation, all of those things that make us who we are, make us humans. There's even an ochre crayon here with carving on it to suggest that even that next level of artistic contribution. All of these things tying into the ocean. Well, you're out there saying, okay, that's great, but what does this have to do with islands? What does this tell us about, I wanna talk about the California islands, right? What does this tell us about islands? And one of the things it does is it shows us a stepping point. This is Gibraltar, I'll just skip past that. I have a black screen in front of me, which is kind of scary. Um, this is Gibraltar, but there's also early use of marine resources by Neanderthals too. But really the question becomes, what, is, what can we say about islands? What does this tell us about islands? It's a big jump to go from forging in the intertidal, right? To go from forging in the intertidal to building a boat and traveling to an offshore island. Now what we've seen, I mentioned my bias again about modern humans. There's possible evidence for seafaring or boat travel as early as 800,000 years ago or so with Homo erectus maybe getting to some islands in Southeast Asia. Well, some of the best evidence though comes again with modern humans and some of the best indisputable evidence when we get to places where we're talking about colonization of Australia and elsewhere. Now I put this quote up here before we start on that odyssey of islands to get us to think about um, just how far we've come. And this is a paper that came out when I was in graduate school by Pat Kirch, who's a huge uh, influence on, on my work and the work of many other scholars. And Pat's quote, he was giving a distinguished lecture for the um, American Anthropological Society, or American Anthropological Association, and his quote here really typifies what much early thinking about islands was. He's talking specifically about Melanesia and Polynesia, but he, he notes there that they were mostly viewed as a cul-de-sac, right? An end point, they were just a footnote, a little tangent on the way to talk about the more interesting parts of world archeology. span Well, as Pat showed 20 years ago, that had really started to change. We'd actually started to see, well, there's a lot of really interesting things going on on islands, much like that explosion in the use of human resources, We've seen an incredible amount of research come from virtually all island groups around the world. It's just blown away. I can't imagine what the next uh, 20 years will be like and bring for us in our understanding of islands. So let's start off in Australia. Australia was never connected to the mainland. You can see this is a map from a recent paper by Sue O'Connor and her colleagues showing that Sunda Peninsula out of Southeast Asia down into Sahul and Australia and Papua New Guinea that were connected. This has become a hotbed for understanding human colonization of islands and seafaring more generally. Um, I put 50,000 years, 50, years ago up there, but two of the most contentious colonization periods in our, in our human history, two of the most debated are when did people colonize the Americas, which I'll get to in a minute, and then the other one is when did people colonize Australia. There's a long versus short chronology. I've done the muddle somewhere in the middle around 50,000 years ago. But what we've seen in recent years is that that region there, Timor and other islands in Southeast Asia were hotbeds of real early human uh, ocean travel and, and ocean voyaging. And one of the cave sites that, again, another cave that's produced really early important information on seafaring and marine voyaging is from this cave here in Timor. This is reported by O'Connor and her colleagues a couple of years ago in Science. This is a 42,000 year old deposit that produced pelagic fish remains, fish hooks like these that suggest really interesting open water maritime adaptations, more sophisticated seafaring that we thought. There have been a couple comments on this. I believe John wrote a comment and a couple others saying, hey, well, wait a second. You know, some of these fish you could get in some marine canyons and other features more close to the shore. But even putting that aside, I think we all recognize this is a really important find uh, in terms of thinking about early ocean voyaging and early colonization. If we tool off to the east a little bit, so we look at this map, we're down here thinking about the cave I just showed you in Australia. But if we go off to the east where Papua New Guinea was and head off into what's called the Bismarck Archipelago, things get even more interesting. Um, and what we start to see there is the, the dates for some of that colonization might be around 35,000, somewhere in there for some of the earliest sites. But by 25,000 years ago, we've got people traveling to these islands, not only journeying to those islands and getting there, but they're taking things with them. They're transporting things. This is the Cuscus, a, a mammal that occurs on many islands in the Bismarck Archipelago. We now have pretty clear evidence and arguments that these were deliberately transported to, by people to those islands, perhaps 20,000, maybe even a few thousand early, years earlier than that. So not only do people get there, but they're bringing luggage with them. 
and they're bringing things with them that can help stock that island, and those islands will never be the same again, right? We start our footprint comes on, it may be a little more subtle. It's not taking out cows and chickens and other things. It's taking out a wild animal in this case, but one that still represents a major transformation of that ecosystem. We can jump over to the Mediterranean. I told you it's gonna be a little schizophrenic. We can jump over to the Mediterranean. This is a map from one of my colleagues focusing on domestication in, in parts of the Eastern Mediterranean. And this is the movement of different crops and other, other goods in those areas. This has long been a hotbed for travel. Many of the islands, Cyprus, other islands, were just transformed by agricultural activities very early on. But if we rewind the clock a little bit and we go to a place like Cyprus, we start to see those subtle indicators again of human activities. The translocation or movement of wild boars, in this case, out to those islands perhaps 11, 12, maybe even 13,000 years ago in some cases. Or we have Alan Simmons' work that suggested maybe people drove hippopotami to extinction, poor pygmy hippopotami to extinction on those islands. This is still a little bit debated and contentious, but again, we get to those topics that start to tell us about the bigger influence people were having very early on on islands around the world. We jump again to the Caribbean, an island group colonized much later, maybe 7,500 years ago or so, and the story becomes very similar, right? The people are different, the things they brought with them, the species are different, the time frame's a little bit different, but the general theme is pretty consistent with the things that were being transported and translocated by humans prehistorically to those various islands. And we have another record or possible issue of extinction there. David Stedman and his group has argued for years that there were human extinctions of things like the giant sloth there up in the, or giant sloth, like the sloth up there in the left, not a giant. There's also evidence for translocation early on of avocados, other wild plants that came to those Caribbean by people before agricultural goods. There's translocation of animals through time coming out of both South America and Mesoamerica. So you've got armadillos, peccary, guinea pigs, opossums, even more beyond that. And this doesn't even include the domesticates, other than the guinea pig, the domesticates that people were taking out to Caribbean islands. And just so I don't mislead you a bit too much, since my focus is on translocations and, and, and terrestrial landscapes, people were having an influence on the ocean as well. This is some of my colleague Scott Fitzpatrick's work in the Caribbean looking at human changes or impacts on shellfish populations. This is kind of a neat study because they showed that there wasn't a big impact from humans on those shellfish populations, which differs from some other cases, but still, people are having an impact and influence on both land and at sea. We jump again, and I promise my, my journey around is almost coming in. And we jump again to the Pacific Islands. One of the most famous case studies is that massive colonization of Pacific Islands, that massive journey spanning thousands of miles out to the most distant reaches of the planet to places like Easter Island and Hawaii. And I bet most of you have heard about the various transformations that happen on those islands. David Stedman's work, again, pretty famous work, showing that right at human arrival, we see landscape clearance, we see burning, we see the extinction of many of the native bird species, the introduction of rats, the introduction of all sorts of things. And then, of course, one of the most touted cases of how awful we people are is the rapid extinction of, of MOA, in this case. You know, maybe as quick as 300 years annihilated from New Zealand. Right? And that's a case of pretty quick human impacts. But even in those cases, there's a lot of sustainability that underlies much of those environmental tra transformations, a lot of sustainability that we don't even oftentimes think about or hear much about because it doesn't grab the headlines quite like the extinction events do. Last event before we come back to the Channel Islands is Madagascar in East Africa. This is an area that we didn't know a lot about until recently, and all of a sudden there's been a ton of work going on in East Africa. I'm lucky to be working with a postdoc, Christina Douglas, right now, who's done most of her field work in Madagascar, working on some amazing sites there, coastal shellmins, but also focusing on, this is a look at one of those areas in East Africa, a look at one of her uh, shell middens. You can see zoomed in on the surface there. All of those little pieces on the surface there are eggshell. They're eggshell fragments scattered all over it from this guy here, the radite, another giant bird, not unlike a moa. These guys are weird though. Their closest relatives are kiwis, little birds. And this guy's about as tall as I am. 
and then there's kiwis over on New Zealand. A very interesting evolutionary relationship there, but she's been trying to understand the extinct extinction of these elephant birds and their decline. So I just told you that moas went extinct rapidly, right? Wiped out by people. Well, here's a case where we have maybe 2,000 years of coexistence with humans. We're not even sure that humans even hunted these things. There aren't any bones. Very few elements of bones ever found in Madagascar archaeological sites. She excavated a couple and found like one bone. But they do find lots of eggshell. And what she's trying to work out now is, well, what does that mean? Did people ignore these elephant birds? Was it revenge of the birds? What was going on here in this, in this case, right? And so people are using them today. They use them for vessels. They eat them. They hollow out the eggshell. She's in the middle of a big project, an SEM project, looking at their eggshell, trying to determine if those eggshell fragments that she's found in archaeological sites were from animals that had already hatched or were from unhatched animals. Right now, we've got a little bit of both in the preliminary samples that she's been looking at. But there's still a case of some continuity and some, some sustainability, at least, of those birds over a, a couple millennia before people arrived. So what about the California islands, right? We've just started out in Africa. We've seen several cases of that very early, early occupation of various islands around the world by people. Some of the subtle influences, the animals or plants they may have been taking out to those islands. And then, of course, I haven't even talked about the agricultural period. Much like the ranching period we think of on the Channel Islands, there are a few islands around the world you can point to that didn't share a similar history, except that history is often much earlier. Agricultural populations reached Mediterranean islands 10,000 years ago and started clearing those. Hawaiian islands, almost from the get-go, from the moment people reached them, they were doing agricultural activities. We have a bit of a unique situation in that case that it wasn't until the ranching period that we had those kind of transformative effects that often accompany agriculture. And one of the things that makes the Channel Islands and the California Islands more generally so special in terms of this broader scheme of human, human uh, colonization of islands is the whole subject and thinking about the peopling of the Americas. And much like, you know, we've had these watershed moments where we had a lot of water puns today. We've had these watershed moments in thinking about human use of marine resources and thinking about the colonization of islands. The people in the Americas had another, another one. We used to think that people walked into the Americas during glacial periods of the Pleistocene, and that was the earliest colonization. We still do. We still do have indications of that kind of migration. But we now know and suspect and have great evidence for an earlier migration a maritime migration up around the Pacific coast, following perhaps what, what John and other, John Ernst and others have called the kelp highway, following a continuous ring of kelp habitats all across that from Northeast Asia into the Americas where people could have had similar types of resources and environments, had somewhat of a familiar seascape to harvest as they work their way down into the Americas and make it to Chile by 15,000 years ago, if not earlier. Right, it's a very compelling case. We are lucky, in the case of the Channel Islands, to have a wonderful early record. And that's a record that goes back over, I'm gonna, let me just say one thing, my bias, I'm gonna be talking about the, primarily the Channel Islands, so I apologize to those of you that live on other, work on other California islands, but we're really lucky to have this fantastic record of very early human colonization, certainly of islands in the Americas, if not you know, any coastal region in the Americas. So we've got, the Arlington Springs site that I think John Johnson's going to talk about later in the week, occupied with human remains about 13,000 years ago. You can see that in the background of this slide. And then the site there that John's working at is a site that, that is located right around the corner and near an area called Radio Point on Santa Rosa Island. This is SRI 512 with dates in the neighborhood of 12,000 years ago. We were very excited about this site. I was going through my notes, John, before I came out here, and I, I think it was like 2008. My, how time flies that we found. It seems like yesterday. But we found these points. We we're so excited about a, a, a point type confirmed in C2 with extinct Candides birds and other remains, but a really unique, what we've called Channel Island barbs and crescents and other points that are all a testament to that very early human presence on the Channel Islands. And then that just stair steps up through time. And you get to a historical record left behind by by Chinese abalone fishermen. This is something Todd Brages has published a book on is the Chinese abalone fisher population that left behind sites just like this with rings of black abalone sitting in the stratum. And at the other end of the spectrum are middens like this one 
with Todd and Quinton Shoup standing on top of a site on San Miguel Island with a blue whale vertebrae sticking right out of the middle of it and about a thousand years of big mid sediment just sitting there and that's full of California mussels and seabirds and seals and sea lions, all of the things that tell us about the human ecological history of the Channel Islands, the human ecological history of the Pacific Ocean, all of those things that tell us about the deep relationships that people have had with California island ecosystems for millennia, for at least 13,000 years. And then, of course, we get great artifact sequences like these that show us the incredible you know, sophisticated maritime cultures of the Shumash, the Tongva, and other peoples, the fish hooks, the barbs, the spear and arrow points, and of course the shell beads that were a form of currency that could be used to, to buy a variety of goods and services. And then all of this having a deep connection to the ocean. That's a model toy canoe that's about a thousand years old that Phil Orr found on Santa Rosa Island. You know, heuristic devices that might help people learn about and, and understand the ocean and get them deeply entwined in their broader cultural history. Well, if you're on an island for 13,000 years, and in some cases, one of the most difficult things for us is to estimate how many people there were, right? Maybe conservatively, we can say, and then we'll all fight about this afterwards, but maybe 3,000 people or so living on the Northern Channel Islands. Imagine that. Next time you pull in to, to Prisoner's Harbor or something, think about a network of villages surrounding the islands with 3,000 people on them. They have to have some sort of influence, all making their living off the wild plants and animals and other resources they could find on those islands. It's a pretty dramatic change from what we see today. And so we've talked about extinction and translocation. What's the extinction record like for the Channel Islands? It's, it's a big question mark, really. It's not like the Hawaiian Islands where we see these dramatic extinctions. Sir, we have some. And of course, I put a swimming elephant in from a mammoth, just to, instead of a mammoth, just to throw you off. But the pygmy mammoth, was it driven to extinction by humans? Maybe. If anything, people were probably the final push over the edge of an already dwindling population. And those dates, of course, have an overlap there potentially now, which suggests maybe people did. But we still don't have a kill site. We still don't have any mammoth bones that are in good association with humans. So there's a big red question mark sitting on that one. Then we look over to the right, and that swimming in there with some saber-toothed salmon is Candides lawi, the flightless sea duck, kind of like a scoter swimming around there in the water. Flightless sea duck, I mean, that's a sitting duck ready to be taken out by people, right? If you have a flightless duck, that should be the first one to go. Well, in this case, you have a protracted extinction all up and down the Pacific coast. It's one that takes some five to 6,000 years to happen, a long period of overlap between humans and Candides. Humans were definitely hunting these guys, probably helped contribute to their extinction, but again, it's one that happens over several millennia. And the last one down on the bottom there is Paramiscus nezidites, the giant mouse that nobody beholds the poor extinction of nezidites. Right? This is something that clearly got out there prior to humans, goes extinct maybe as recent as 1,000 years ago, found on the northern islands, maybe even driven to extinction by, we don't know, late period human activities, or by another mouse, our friend Paramiscus maniculatus, the island endemic that we know of comes in only about 12,000 years ago, may have outcompeted Paramiscus nezidites. There's still a lot of questions there. And then Paul Collins has done an incredible job assembling records of occurrence data of all sorts of other birds and other species that oftentimes are represented by one bone or just a few bones. And it becomes a question of whether or not there was a population there. What is, you know, does that extinction actually equal something with humans? So the extinction record is a bit of a question mark. The translocation record, another one that's a, a bit of a, a mystery and an intrigue, but one that we've, I think, learned a lot about in recent years, and that's thinking about some of the mammals that have come to the, the Channel Islands. So the island fox that we all love, and I saw the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History's fox mobile out in the parking lot this morning. I had never seen that before, it was fantastic. But if we think about foxes, the Catalina Island ground squirrel, island spotted skunk, Paramiscus maniculatus, all of these animals actually have a deep relationship with people, and they have since the moment they arrived on the islands. One thing we can say about foxes is the best evidence right now from fossil, archaeological, and historical records, including you know, some 30 radiocarbon dates, including isotope data, and emerging genetic data suggest that foxes appeared on the islands no earlier than about 9,000 years ago. That's at least 4,000 years after humans arrived. Whether or not they rafted out and it was a sweepstakes kind of colonization, 
or they opt in a boat, which is a little bit more parsimonious, at least in my vote, vote, it's a moot point because their entire history has overlapped with people who lived on those islands. Some of the isotope data we have on foxes is pretty interesting too. A lot of it suggests they're foraging for wild foods and they're a little bit separate from, from what dogs are eating. Catalina Island ground squirrels. We've got some preliminary genetic data that Courtney Hoffman's run, and she'll probably shake her head that I'm even mentioning it, but it suggests a very recent, like thousand years, that's like a blink of an eye, arrival for ground squirrels, or maybe 2,000 years ago at most, right? So there's another interesting case coming in in the human era. Paramiscus maniculatus, much the same thing, 12,000 years ago, right? So a record of translocation and movement, even if we don't believe that the fox came to the islands um, by human transport, it's very difficult for all of us to argue against the notion that they were transported to the southern islands. Rene Villanueth and his group, these are two of his photos, have done a lot of work on foxes in the southern islands, and I think it's pretty clear that foxes were transported to those islands by humans about 6,000 years ago. So think about what those islands might have looked like prior to that. That's a pretty amazing thing. And of course, they keep upping the ante. Rene's found a number of dog and fox burials on San Nicolas Island. This is one from about 10 years ago, a double dog burial there together. I think he told me he found a triple dog burial. I haven't gotten to talk to him yet, but I think he's got like, like a dozen dog burial now, or there's a dozen of them lined up. But each year they find more and more dogs, and what they're finding are pet cemeteries where you've got dogs, foxes, the remains of raptors all buried in these ritual contexts. The isotopes from some of these animals show very similar overlap between foxes, dogs, and humans suggesting there might have been some possible provisioning at some of these sites too. Again, a lot of overlap between what people were doing and what was happening. And I want to just quickly, as I, I start to kind of wrap up, move on to the marine environment. But I want to throw out an idea. If people were to have brought foxes out there or had this relationship, to me, that makes them even more special, even more important, and even more worthy of protection. I occasionally hear what I think are scary words, oh, people did that, oh gosh, you know, it's just like a feral cat or dog. To me, that is the absolute wrong way to think about it. Maybe we can get into that in the question and answer period. But I see some of these same transformations are happening in the ocean, too. And this is a study we've been doing for a number of years, looking at the abundance of various seal and sea lion species in the archaeological record compared to today. And there's a great flip-flop or X that happens where prehistorically Guadalupe fur seals are the most common. Elephant seals are very rare. Today it's almost the op opposite pattern. Lots and lots and lots of elephant seals, very few Guadalupe fur seals. So what does that mean? You know, you've got pinnipeds that recovered from a very huge devastation during the fur trade, virtual extinction in some cases, but they've reassembled in a way that's very different than what we think things were like at least for the last 10, 12,000 years. Now, one of the interesting things is those we didn't have a lot of data on pinnipeds from early in the occupation of the Channel Islands. We didn't know what was going on, say, 12,000, 11,000 years ago. Courtney Hoffman and a few others are going to report on uh, some work on collagen fingerprinting and ancient DNA that, for the first time, gives us some of the species that were found in those earliest sites. And interestingly enough, there's a lot of elephant seal in those bones, suggesting maybe an early, early hunting by humans there that dwindled through time. And then if we go on land and look at plants, too, I know later today Christina Gill is going to give a talk on some of their work that on, on plants and, and possible shumash management of plants, like these fields of blue dicks on Santa Cruz Island. This is just work that's just now developing. We've been very focused on marine ecosystems and, and uh, animals and, and other, other groups and kind of neglected plants, but there's some really exciting work coming out and thinking about you know, not only how people might have managed some of these ecosystems prehistorically, but what might the footprints of that type of management be today? How might we see that, those little footprints on the landscape? How might we tease that apart? How might that help us in the next couple generations with climatic uncertainty, increased anthropogenic influence? How might that help us think a little bit better about the management of the islands? I put this in here as one of my favorite archaeological sites, but also just thinking about the, the terrestrial subsidies that Native Americans and others have been giving to parts of the Channel Islands for a long time. If you look at the sea cliff there, you see a little white stripe going off into the distance. This is SMI 468 out on San Miguel Island. That's all archaeological material. It's a midden deposit. It goes all the way back to the terrace behind it. In some spots, it's like a meter deep. 
That soil is loaded with calcium carbonate, it's loaded with nitrogen, it's different than the surrounding soil. So how does that then affect the plant communities? So I think the work Christina and others are doing is really gonna help us transform our views on that. What about this, fire, right? The only real glimpse we have, we know from Jan Timbrook's work and others the, from years ago on the mainland, the Shumash were burning. There's some great, great ethnographic accounts of that. We know less about what was going on on the islands, about how people might have been burning on the islands or, or, or setting fires there. Really the best glimpse we have is Scott Anderson's work from some of the few sea cores that are out there that, that are, are sea cores, from the sea, few pollen cores that are available from the islands that give us a pretty decent charcoal record. Right? And they show, and one of the interesting things is a spike in charcoal, a huge spike right around 4,000 to 3,500 years ago that may suggest an increase in fire. This is a period possibly associated with some cultural changes as well. This may indicate an increase in fires. But you can imagine anybody who slogged through the brush out on Santa Cruz Island or elsewhere, if you need to get to another village on the other side of the island, you're going to forge a trail. You may be using burning like people did all around the world. Something else for us to think about. I think this is sort of an untapped area of inquiry is to think about the nature of prehistoric use of fire on the Channel Islands. So where does this get us? I want to just wrap up with a couple concluding thoughts on what this odyssey might tell us and how it might help shape our thinking, certainly as we leave the room and maybe as you think about a lot of the talks you're going to hear throughout this week and, the, and, and throughout this symposium. I put this up here. This is one of my favorite spots on the Channel Islands. This is on San Miguel Island. It's uh, just on sort of the east, southeast side of Harris Point. And it's like classic Channel Islands. There's not a person around. There's harbor seals, sea lions hanging out down on the beach. There's a whole bunch of little white seagulls breeding there. You can see the little white dots out. Seagulls hate me, by the way, but they're there breeding and <laughs> dotted out on the landscape. What's so important about this picture is what you don't see, though, and that's the massive Shumash village site that's sitting basically in that entire low-lying area there. It's got about 10 possible house features on it. It's got midden accumulation over the meter. It's only like 600 years old, too. So you could have been sitting right in that spot thinking about a couple hundred people here. Would those sea lions have been there? I wouldn't. I'd been on the offshore rock as far away as I could get. Would those gulls be there? Anybody who spent time in Anacapa in the summertime knows that those gulls would not have been there, right? If you're living there, that's not a fun place to be. So it tells us just that the Channel Islands, they're a place of change. All the California islands, they've changed an incredible amount. That's both through natural climatic change, through geologic change, through the influence of people through time, whether it's the ranchers or Native Americans or now the managers. They're a place of change, and we need to think about that change and understand that change if we're going to get to a better period of management and what's coming to be a very great period of uncertainty and climate change and other activities. I put this up here just for you to think about. The Channel Islands, I put management in quotes because that means so many different things to people, but the Channel Islands really have been managed by people since the moment people arrived. They were doing things to help with the management and alteration of the Channel Islands, and that increases in scale and intensity through time. That management might look like this, the Shumash, the Shumash Village from a diorama at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. Maybe that management looked more like this. Ooh, he called it management. You know, maybe it looked more like this, the ranching period, a great period in the history of the Channel Islands, a really important period, a frustrating period, right? One we worry about when you're dealing with restoration ecology but still an important period in the Channel Islands. Or maybe the management looks like this, right? The latest wave that we're in. All of these things, though, lead to the accumulation of what the Channel Islands are, what they were, and I would argue what we want them to become. I'm going to leave you with just three quick thoughts to wrap up. The first one is, do we need to reframe some of our goals? Do we need to rethink some of our opinions about the best way to move forward on the Channel Islands? Do we need to have a more radical thought about what it is the Channel Islands should look like. Why do we make the decisions that we do in both the management of cultural and natural resources? And this isn't something just for the Channel Islands or the California Islands. This is something that we need to think about for virtually every other place on our planet. Because if that odyssey I showed you told you nothing, it should tell you that, man, humans spread like wildfire. We've been virtually everywhere on this planet for a long period of time. So do we need to reframe some of our goals? Do we need to have a better integration in thinking about the past. 
And most importantly, do we need to think that we're not returning to something that's natural or pristine? I don't think anyone here would necessarily argue that, but it's an important point. We're not going back. There is no magical Channel Islands that, oh my gosh, the pre-ranching period was perfect. Let's get together, hold hands, we'll have a kumbaya moment. It's going to look so good. You know, there, there is nothing like that. Unfortunately, it's much more complicated than that. You can go to any spot on the Channel Islands and there's a diff it looked different 5,000 years ago than it did 1,000, 500. And so if we're going to think about what we want it to look like in the future, I think it's going to challenge us to think about who are we managing the, these resources for? Why are we doing what we're doing? You know, and I think yesterday, those of you that were at the Channel Islands Rediscovery Workshop, Scott Morris and Christy Bozer and others who helped put that together, that's a radical step forward, I think, in thinking about a broader, more holistic type of management. The other one is this, is let's learn from and protect the past. But like I said earlier, there's no magic rewind button, right? You can't be like Cher from the, late, from the early 90s and turn back time. It's just not going to happen, right? We can't do that. There is no magic rewind button. The past is not a prescription for where we want to go in the, in, the, in the future. But it does provide a lot of perspective. It does provide us with that holistic perspective of what the Channel Islands look like and where we want them to go in the future. Not only that, but the descendant communities who lived on the Channel Islands are still here. And we had a nice talk about this yesterday, too, but they're still here and with us. There is so much we could learn from indigenous knowledge from working with the Shumash, the Tongva, and other peoples and thinking about the future management of it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we should bring people back and introduce 3,000 people to the Channel Islands. It couldn't be any further from it. But we need to think about the legacies of the land use that people had on those islands. The last one is moving beyond the boat, or you could say beyond the bunkhouse, maybe beyond the field station. We'll do that. Beyond the boat or beyond the field station. You know, I can't tell you how many times I have had this like epiphany moment on a boat ride to or from the Channel Islands where I've run into someone working on something else and learned an incredible amount in that hour and a half or two hour boat ride. The key now though is to take it the next step and go beyond the boat ride to bring us all in a room like this symposium does to talk about all of our different disciplines and what our shared interests are and how that ultimately can help us move forward in managing and caring for and protecting the place we love so much, the California Islands. With that, thank you all very much.